solution is a part of differential two point but that is dependent on you have a formula so inversely proportional to the so the smaller the wavelength is smaller you are able to the distance between the two particles the smaller distance can be seen and therefore the ground is fine right and the other thing was when dr kima talked about is the numerical aperture and for that we knew that for the numerical aperture we needed that diffractive index and all this so i'm not going to go to it because that has been covered so so the basic point is that you need to have a waveform which has a small wavelength right so you want to increase the resolution why do you want to increase the resolution because you want to increase the magnification so a light source the visible light source has its own limitation at maximum magnification or resolution that it can reach after that even if you keep on magnifying there is an empty magnification because you will not be able to resolve the two points right so that is why electrons are required to have increase magnification and resolution so that is what is a transmission electron microscope that we'll be talking about today so anybody can identify you're looking at this okay i'll tell you this is from a lung this is a new site cells which line the atmosphere those can be seen by light microscope so why i'm showing you this electron microscope picture something which was causing error in your life for the past two and a half years so virus particles can you look at them in the light microscope so what do you require so where where are these so you see these beautiful viral particles right you can see them here also so if you even have a high resolution a better microscope you can even look at those spikes the corona spikes that is why it is known as a corona virus so these are the virus particles so this is the cilia right but these are the particles which you can see this is nothing but by these are proteins the surfactant proteins which are there in the cytoplasm of the nucleus okay that can be seen by an electron microscope but that, that is not why i'm showing you this electron microscope okay so that is the importance of a electron microscope so this is about covid 19 so a covid 19 particle is how big 80 around 80 nanometer but Different papers have talked about it as fifty to hundred nanometers. Okay, this is just to give you a feel of what is the size difference for different cells, so that you understand what we are looking at. So when we talk of a mammalian cell, so this is a neutrophil. So we can say it is around ten micron. Okay, and a normal human cell will be around. Apart from us, this is also a cell. But apart from the neutrophil, neutrophil, neutrophil cells can be a. Of course, it will vary about the type of cell we are talking about, but it will be something around eighty to hundred micron large. A normal tissue cell. I'm not talking of the blood cell. A bacteria is around one micron. so what can a mic uh, i showed you a virus particle right so this is what an electron microscope can do it can show you particles which are very small so we can look at ribosomes under the transmission electron microscope we can if what is the size of the mitochondria i i know you will not uh, remember that it is around bacteria can be seen by a light microscope also isn't it Uh, if you look at the size of a mitochondria, it is around 0.5 to 1 micron. So practically speaking, you should be able to look at a mitochondria in a light microscope. This is. But if you see a cell, you can see those granules which represent the mitochondria. But the internal structure cannot be seen under a light microscope. 
that can be seen only by an electron microscope because you need to resolve the different parts of the mitochondria to say that this is a mitochondria. Okay, so that is why the electron microscope is important. So this is just to give you an idea. So what we are talking about is sub-microscopic particles or things that can be seen only by an electron microscope. This is just to show a gradation that you have a microscopic picture, light microscopy, scanning in the transmission. So coming back to the human cell, as I said earlier, so you remember this from your biology days, 11, 12, right? So this is a typical cell. And that is as pathologists, we are able to look at it each day under the electron microscope. And this is how it looks. When we look at it, this is a hepatocyte. This is how it can look under an electron microscope. So now you can make out these are the mitochondria, right? And these are what are these? Uh, this is not Golgi, this is endoplasmic retina. And depending upon whether you are able to see, I'm not sure if you're able to see, but I can see these particles. You can see these small particles on my foot, which is a rough endoplasmic. Reticulum. So you are able to see these ribosomes also in the electron. So th that is why an electron microscope is required, and that can something be, uh, cannot be achieved by a routine light microscope. Now you see the size difference between a light microscope. You can keep it on the desk. Look at it. An electron microscope. The transmission electron microscope requires the whole room for it. There's a whole space. I will talk about it, why it needs so much of space. But it needs a whole room to keep the electron microscope. So that is the size difference uh, between a light microscope and a transmission electron microscope. Uh, so uh, the first electron microscope was built in around 1931. So it is relatively recent. Okay. And with a resolution of 50 to 100 nanometers. And uh, Dr. Ruska, who got a Nobel Prize later for this discovery, he had tried to made, make an electron microscope. And this is the earliest model of an electron microscope which was used. And this is his initial writing in which he designed an electron microscope. And he said that this is, it was initially capable of only 16,000 magnification. A routine light microscope gives you how much of magnification? 100x to the oil version. And if you replace the IP by 10x by a 15x, it can even be 1500. But most of them, if you use an oil version, it be 1000. Right? So this was that. The initial one showed you 16,000 magnification. Okay. And then companies started coming in, uh, private companies to make these electron microscopes. So if you can see that it is relatively new, it is 1973, right? That electron microscopy started. So this we have been talking day in and day from the past two days. So what is important for an electron microscope is the resolving part. It can differentiate two points. 0.2 nanometers apart and uh, a light microscope can do it for 0.2 microns and your eye can do it for 0.2 millimeter. Okay. So this is the crux of it. Lambda, that is what we are talking about. If lambda is small, the distance between the two points which can be resolved becomes small and therefore the resolving power increases. Right? So that is why the scientists thought that because electrons have a very short wavelength, they can be used to as a light source to increase the magnification and the resolving power. So the beauty about the electrons is that the resolving power in an electron microscope also depends upon the accelerating voltage. So the, what I'm trying to say is that according to the accelerating voltage with which the electrons power you can increase the resolving power because the wavelength keeps on decreasing. Okay, so for example, in our microscope, we have a microscope which is up. We can use it up to 200 kV. 
so but then uh, 120 kg so we have 1800 and 120 kg so when i we use an accelerating voltage of 100 kg the wavelength decreases further and therefore we can go to higher magnification so that is why the accelerating voltage is important and the other thing is that the lens that we use in a light microscope is which type of lens what is it made of? What are your specs made of? If you are just in glass type, glass lenses in your microscope. Whereas electron beam cannot pass through the glass, right? So it needs electromagnetic lens. So that is how it is different from a routine light microscope. So these are the basic differences between a light and an electron microscope. So what the source of illumination is electrons. You have so if you see, I have mentioned the kV. So at 100 kV, this is the wavelength. But if I decrease the kV, the wavelength also increases and vice versa. The medium electrons can travel in the air. Yes? They can travel, but they will command all particles which are there to air, which we will not be So they need a vacuum system. And that is the reason because of the activating voltage that you require. And because they can only travel in vacuum, you have such a big instrument that is used for an electron microscope. And lenses, as I said, is electromagnetic. Screen that we see is a fluorescent screen. I'll show you in one of the figures. So when the light beam strikes the screen, it fluoresces, and therefore you can look at it. So there are basically two types of electron microscope. One is a scanning and one is a transfer. What I will be talking about today is transmission. Uh, Professor Mitra from PDRI will be talking about scanning electron microscope. What is the difference? Can anybody tell me? Any gastroenterologist here? Any medicine person? Any medicine person? Any medicine person? Now, again, which one is scanning and which one is transmission? Just to tell you the concept. Okay. So that is an RBC, this is a bacteria, that is a mitochondria, and that is a glomerular basement membrane. Okay. Uh, these are three elements. <laughs> this is a, what is this? And what is this? These are platelets, right? So this is how it will look. That is an RBC, a neutrophil, or a and a platelet will look under a scanning electron microscope, right? And this is how a bacteria will look like. So it is, a, it is quite a fascinating sign. So 
So now I'll be talking just about transmission electron microscope because scanning will be taken up by Dr. Mitra. So as I said, it is a direct counterpart and it involves a passage of high velocity electron beam and it is known as transmission because the specimen should be thin enough that around 50% of the electrons are transmitted. And that is why you will get an image. Otherwise, you will not get any image of the tissue that you have put in the electron beam. And the emergent beam is focused by a set of lenses which are electromagnetic lenses. So when we look at the elect transmission electron microscope, these are the components. This is a microscope column. You have surrounding it a large vacuum, vacuum system, which is made up of different uh, uh, pressure pumps, which maintain the vacuum. And then you have the control panel. There is a power supply unit, which is separate. This is a, uh, at the back, you have the power supply. Air compressor is also needed and water chiller is also needed because electromagnetic lenses become very heated up. Right? And so they have to be cooled. So that is why a transmission electron microscope is a big instrument which requires a large amount of material to make it uh, functional. Uh, so when we look at the cross section of the microscope column, so the electron gun is at the top. So there is a beam which comes from the electron gun. So electron gun is also made up of, you can use different types of filaments, but we also use the tungsten filament. Other filament which is used is known as a lithium bromide, that is LAB6. So it emits an electron beam and there is an anode which, uh, so that the electron beam has a coherent path. Then you have the condenser lens, a specimen chamber where the specimen is kept and different sets of lenses. And lastly, you have the viewing chamber. So we have an illumination system that is of electron gun and the condenser lens, the imaging system. And this is what is an electron uh, beam which comes from the tungsten filament, which acts as a cathode. And this is the anode so that the beam is effective, electron source is maintained. These are the electromagnetic lenses which are used. So when we go to the uh, image translating system, it has a fluorescent screen. As I said earlier, the electron beam comes so after passing through different lenses to the specimen and then it comes on the fluorescent screen where an image is formed. And now you have the CDVT cameras and the digital output where you can look at it on the digital screen. Initially, we used to keep photographic films. In the earlier microscope, there used to be photographic films which used to take more images. So this is how a fluorescent screen looks like. So if you uh, look at this image, this is an image of what? What is the tissue which has been kept in the specimen chamber? So this is a part of part. What, what is the part? Glomerulus. Very good. So this is, these are the foot processes. This is a glomerular basement membrane and these are the capillaries of the, capillary lumen of the glomerulus. Right? So these are glomerular capillary loops. Right? And this is a podocyte, which is sending its processes towards the glomerular basement. Okay, so this is again to show it in a different way, but similarly, you have lenses and a source, which, and the imaging system is at the bottom. So the image formation in light microscopy is by differential absorption, whereas in electron microscopy, it is by the transmitted electrons and also by the electrons which are scattered. So the electron scattering power is increased by solutions which have high atomic weight. And therefore, the staining that we do in a light microscopy is completely different from what we do in an electron microscope for tissue which has to be seen by an electron microscope. So what do we need to have a tissue which can be processed for electron microscopy? What do you think? How do you make tissue for light microscopy? Okay. So you can have surgery or supplement can have biopsy. Where do you keep it? What do you think? Have to do it after that? Sectioning, sectioning, before the sectioning. Sectioning, sectioning. This is the quality of the 
basically you want to at the same time preserve the ultra structure you want to remove the molecule water molecule but still you want to preserve the ultra structure and that is why the, the processing for ultra uh, uh, cn is cumbersome it is time taking it is cumbersome and there is a lot of technique which is involved technical aspect is very important for processing on uh, electron microscopy tissues so the aim of specimen preparation is that the ultra structure should be preserved the section should be thin because as i said 50% of electrons should be transmitted embedding should be in a material which can withstand the electron beam and we need to stain with high atomic metal because we not want it to be scattered also transmitted and scattered at the same time so that is why we need to take into account these things when we process for transmission and that is why it takes time as compared to a light microscope so what is the fixative that we use for electron microscopy okay so uh, basic sense that it keeps the ultra structure preserved right but when you take it in glutaldehyde we keep the tissue in refrigerator as compared to a light microscopy where we never keep the tissue in refrigerator we have to keep it at room temperature why because the penetration power of glutaldehyde is very low so if you keep it outside the tissue will get automatic so that is why we take it in glutaldehyde and we if you do not send to the lab immediately you are asked to keep it in your door of the fridge okay so uh, as i said fixation is by glutaldehyde you also need a second fixation that is by osmium tetroxide and the steps are almost similar as you have for light microscopy resin are used for it as i said what were you using for light microscopy that that was it right so light microscopy and then you embed polymerize these are the steps so just to compare this is how a block of a electron microscopy looks like and this is how a block for histology looks like this is a wax block look at the amount of tissue that you have in the wax block this is a tissue for where is the tissue can you identify it you see something black at the tip that is a tissue so this is the amount of tissue that you can process for electron microscopy i'll show you the grid on which we keep the section so that is why you need special technique for processing and you need special techniques for cutting and staining for these small amount of tissues and still we are able to give a lot of information from the electron microscope okay so that is why it is said that it needs an ultra microtome because the tissue is so small and you need very thin section how much thin 60 nanometers around 60 nanometers so that is the thinning and we do staining with uranyl acetate and lead citrate this is the grid right you can see this just a small copper just a small copper grid where we keep the section it is around 3 mm in diameter that is all uh, of course electron microscopy because we are using material that is resin osmium tetroxide uranium acetate lead citrate so this is 
is all hazardous material and therefore we need to take into account a lot of precautions when we are in an electron microscopy laboratory. So now, what are the other procedures that Ian can do? Do we have somebody from microbiology? What is negative staining? So your background is stained, but your ring of interest remains unstained. So that is known as negative staining, and that we can use for virus particles in electron microscopy. And so it can not even just used for tissue section, it can also be used for viral particles, particulate material, it can be seen as a negative staining. And of course, we also, if you have some nephrology residents, you, should, you will be knowing that we also take out tissue from the paraffin embedded tissue, and then you can process it for electron microscopy. Uh, we can do immunoelectron. Uh, there are methods like cryofixation, which may be of interest to PLT students, where we can cryofix the tissue uh, so that the water becomes ice and complete ultrastructure is maintained. Okay, so this is about the negative staining for a virus particle. What are the limitations? The limitations appear to be obvious. So it is a very expensive instrument. What do you think will be an average cost of an electron microscope? A basic microscope. What is that a life cycle? One lakh electron. Okay, depending of course on the type of lenses and a lot of what would do you think would an electron microscope? Depends again on the type of microscope, but a basic one will not be less than 2.5 or 2.5, 2.5. A basic one, I'm talking about. The ones that the IITs have will be something quite high, depending upon how much they can measure. So, the other thing is it is expensive, yes. It is time consuming. A smaller area, of course, is examined. Vacuum is essential. There is an uh, electrical and optical systems which are required. The sample cannot be volatile. It cannot be wet. The processing is so uh, technique uh, dependent. And of course, as I said, because you use a lot of hazardous chemicals, it is a health. It can be a health hazard if you do not work properly in an electron microscope laboratory. What are the applications that you will tell? What do you think? That is something. Why do you need it in nephrology? That is one sign that we are using the maximum amount of electron microscopy for nephrology. That is why I'm asking for nephrology. So, what do you use it for? One is the location of the deposit. Second is the type of deposit. You heard about organized deposits? So not only the location, but the type of Right? Yes. And then you said about photosynthesis. Right. So when you have something to do, anything else, somebody wants to do. Right. So, so that is organized deposit. That is known as organized deposit. So uh, nowadays, in if you look at the practical medicine part of it, most of the applications are in for diagnostic field is in nephrology and the other area is sometimes in liver but not so much of importance rarely in liver is one of the indications other would be skin muscle skin and muscle because you want to look at what other junctions between the keratinocytes between the collagen but that also is now relatively less used because you have different immunohistochemical markers and other techniques which can help you in making the diagnosis. So uh, basically it is for renal diseases, alcohols, thin basement membrane, you're looking photocytopathies, inclusions, organized deposits, histiocytosis. Initially it was used, but now you have because of the immunohistochemical markers, it is not mandatory. 
similarly for skin disorders myopathies uh, neurological diseases some of the neurological diseases can be diagnosed only by an electron microscope some uh, like uh, catacel ncd and ncl uh, for cilia it is still being used to look at these dynein arcs you remember your biology classes these were the so you can look at cilia so especially in uh, respiratory ciliary dysfunction and in even in patients with infertility where you want to look at the uh, motility of the sperms these are some examples of uh, mitochondrial myopathy this is of a catacel where you can see these inclusions uh, this is alport's where the basement membrane you can look at it and it is a basket weave or splitting of the glomerular basement membrane the lamina tensor Uh, so there are a large number of models of both of scanning and transmission electron microscope and they keep on improving day by day uh, because of the material science applications for it and engineering techniques you need these instruments for the material sciences for structural biology for cellular biology and various biomaterials this is something which fascinates a lot of people so that is why i put in the picture nano particles so these are very small particles which can be looked by an electron microscope and the size is around it varies from 1 to 100 nanometers and therefore you have this bar okay so biomaterial uh, thing this is about something like a uh, uh, we keep on having students from the universities who uh, keep coming for visualizing electron and this is our electron microscope uh, this is a column and this is our team in electron microscopy our technician madhulika farat all uh, some of my peers okay any questions so i believe you can keep it for 2 to 3 minutes but as i said you have to keep it in place second it has to cut it into small pieces it will not be more than one pieces so for example if in a biopsy comes to us we generally as soon as it comes to us we cut it into small pieces that are not more than 1 millimeter in size and keep it in the refrigerator Longer, but you have to remember that it is in the refrigerator. But ideally, if you have a lab which is working nearby, it is better to process it, osmicate it, and then keep it in buffer. So that is what we do. So, if, for example, we have a very we have a tissue which is very large. We know that that we will not be able to move so many grams. So we take the tissue sample, address the tissue, and keep it in buffer. Keep it in buffer. Because it is already osmicated, it does not escape. It is fixed, osmicated. Any other question? Thank 
Some infections in gastroenterology where electron microscopy is very important. It cannot be looked by in a light microscope. Any other questions or even questions in the last two classes? So how how did you did you like this microscopic course? Or yes, you are doing it for the one. 
Thank you. 